welcome to Novel Conversations. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and for each conversation, I talk to two readers about one novel, and together we summarize the story for you. We'll introduce you to the characters, tell you what happens to them, and we'll read from the book along the way. So, if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Today, I'll be having a conversation about the novel East of Eden by John Steinbeck, and I'll be joined in my conversation by our Novel Conversations readers, Ildi and Scott Rich. Ildi, Scott, hello. Hello, Frank. Hi, Frank. Ildi, Scott, before I get started, let me read a brief introduction to today's novel, East of Eden. Okay. Written by John Steinbeck and published in 1952, East of Eden is the story of two families, the Trasks and the Hamiltons. But it is also the story of a place, California's Salinas Valley, and of a time, the years before and during World War I. With Adam Trask, Samuel Hamilton, and their children, we follow the two families as they interact with each other through the years, seeking their piece of paradise and the new American dream. How the Trasks and Hamiltons live and grow while watching America move toward war, all the time living just east of paradise, make up the bulk of our novel, East of Eden, by John Steinbeck. Scott, with that introduction, let me ask you, is this the first time you've read East of Eden? Yes, it is. This is my first encounter with East of Eden. Did you enjoy it? I loved it. I found it to be a masterful, profound reflection upon one biblical theme with a really fascinating twist of autobiography mixed in. Well, Scott, clearly this is a retelling of the Abel and Cain story from the Bible, but you mentioned a biographical aspect to it. Whose biography? John Steinbeck's biography, at least part of it. I thought it was amazing that it wasn't until a third way through the novel that you actually find out that John Steinbeck is actually the narrator. The narrator went unnamed until page 280, and then all of a sudden his name is John, and then you find out his father's name was Steinbeck, and you put two and two together, and I was stunned. (laughs) Ildi, for me, it added to the enjoyment of reading this novel once I knew the narrator was John Steinbeck. It adds an authenticity in that you don't know how much is true and how much is actually fiction. Isn't that always our dilemma when reading fiction? We're never quite sure how much of his own life an author brings to a novel. Well, that's what makes it good fiction, because we can relate it to someone real and then to ourselves. And Steinbeck, through one of his characters, says, if a story is not about the hearer, he will not listen. And he goes on to say, a great and lasting story is about everyone, or it will not last. Well, Ildi, as we read this novel 50 years later, does it still meet John Steinbeck's criteria? Is it still about the here? I absolutely think so. The Bible is known for having timeless themes, and I think Steinbeck touches on the idea of predestination in the biblical story. I absolutely think it's relevant today, and it will be relevant 100 years from now, because it touches on timeless biblical themes. Ildi, it sounds like you've given this novel a lot of thought. Was this the first time you read it? Yes, it's the first time I've read it, and I'm still working through a lot of the themes. All right, Scott, during my brief introduction, I mentioned that this story is essentially about two families, the Trasks and the Hamiltons. Actually, Frank, before we meet either family, we encounter the Salinas Valley, which becomes home to all the families that we will quickly meet. That's right, Scott. The Salinas Valley of California is almost another character in our novel. It really is, and as anyone who has been there can tell you, it's just this huge salad bowl filled with lettuce and asparagus and every sort of vegetable green you could imagine until these dry, barren hills cut off the gardens on either end of the valley. And Ildi, our first family, the Hamiltons, live in the Salinas Valley, but not in the garden part of the valley. They live in the barren, deserted hills that have no water, basically. Samuel and Liza Hamilton have over 1,700 acres and can't get a drop of water out of them. And the ironic part of that is that Samuel Hamilton is a water diviner. He finds water for other families. There's a lot of irony surrounding Samuel in that he is a water diviner and can't find a drop of water on his land. He invents all sorts of machinery to help other people run their farms, and yet he can't make a dime come out of his own farm. The Hamilton family is incredibly fertile with nine children, and they have the most infertile unproductive chunk of land anywhere near the Salinas Valley. And yet, they're a happy family. They describe themselves as poor, and yet they have more fun than any family they know. Now, Scott, Samuel Hamilton was not a native Californian. 
No, he is from the north of Ireland, from a long line of small family farmers. He had this love of knowledge and of books, and he used to squirrel them away and probably let some of his work go as he's reading away from the watchful eyes of his wife. Samuel was best known in this area for his storytelling abilities. He was, and he would tell comical stories. In fact, most people called him a comical genius. He basically made everyone who came to him feel great. Always happy, always joyful, always funny. And then his wife was the opposite. Steinbeck describes her as having a dour Presbyterian mind and a code of morals that pinned down and beat the brains out of nearly everything that was pleasant to do. <laughs> but they were very happy together. They were. They were a good match. And Ildi, after John Steinbeck introduces us to the poor but happy Hamiltons, he then introduces us to the rich but unhappy Trask family. Steinbeck introduces us to Adam Trask. Steinbeck says, this kind of man bought land and good land. Scott, when we first meet Adam Trask, he's not a rich man. No. When we first meet Adam, he is being raised by his mother and father, who are, in fact, quite poor. That's right. They're living on a small, poor farm in Connecticut, and his father, Cyrus, has just come back from the Civil War, missing a leg. And he's filled with stories about what a great soldier he was and how he's involved in every possible campaign in the different battlefields of the Civil War. But, in fact, he pretty much just happened to lose a leg and lived a life of debauchery the entire time he was in the army. This is what John Steinbeck tells us. Adam's father, Cyrus, was something of a devil. He really was quite the devil. He gets back from the Civil War with a certain disease he passes on to his wife. She commits suicide, and then he feeds himself and his infant son nothing but alcohol for the next two and a half days. And within two weeks, Cyrus finds a woman, a 17-year-old woman, woos her, weds her, beds her, and impregnates her. And Adam soon has a brother. Adam and Charles, the two Trask brothers. And you'll find in this novel that anyone's name, beginning with A, is the biblical Abel, and anyone whose name starts with a C is the biblical Cain. The bad one. Right now, I want to concentrate on another C. Once he has his second marriage and his second son, life changes a lot for Cyrus Trask. Well, he fought for about half an hour before he lost his leg, but his storytelling about his time in the war and his very articulate critique of how the war is being fought earns him a great deal of respect until somehow the federal government calls him up and gives him a well-paying position within the United States Army for the rest of his life. That's right. A half hour's worth of military service turns into a lifetime of stories and a lifetime job with the federal government helping them fight wars. He's really a complete fraud who is utterly successful. Steinbeck says that at the very first, Cyrus knew he was lying, but it was not long before he was equally sure that every one of his stories were true. And because of all his storytelling, he becomes fascinated and obsessed with military maneuvers and procedures. And so he reads and he studies and he does become somewhat of an expert. Ildi, you're right. He eventually does train himself to become somewhat of a military expert. But problems arise when he tries to raise his children as a military expert. He basically takes his sons, Adam and Charles, and treats them like they were in boot camp. And Charles, who is an athletic and competitive type of child, enjoys it and thrives on it. But Adam resents it because that's not in his nature. But his lack of parenting skills goes even beyond that. Cyrus commits the cardinal sin of parenting. He tells one child that he loves him more. And Adam is the child that Cyrus Trask loves more, and Charles takes it out on Adam. How does Charles know that that's how his father feels about Adam? Charles has felt it for a long time, and the one concrete fact that he can pinpoint is that at one point, Charles gets his father Cyrus a knife. A knife he saved weeks and months to get the money to buy. And then Cyrus basically puts it in his pocket and you never see it again. He never sharpens it. He never uses it. It's nowhere to be seen. And Charles noticed on that same birthday, Adam found him a mongrel puppy that he picked up in the woodlot and he gave it to him. He didn't care enough to get anything that actually costed money. And Cyrus sleeps with that dog, loves that dog, wouldn't go anywhere without that dog. And Charles is just stuck on how he didn't accept his knife and he loves this godforsaken puppy. This rejection of Charles leads to a major confrontation between Charles and Adam. 
Yes, essentially Charles tries to kill Adam. But Charles doesn't get the chance to actually finish the deed. Shortly thereafter, Adam is sent to the army. Charles is not allowed to go into the army. And Cyrus Trask goes to work in Washington, essentially never to return to Connecticut, his farm, or his children. In fact, Scott, while Adam's in the army, Charles is alone on the farm, and Cyrus is in Washington, Cyrus dies. That's right. But surprise, surprise, he leaves the boys over $100,000 in cash, which in the late 1800s, early 1900s, is a fortune. A huge fortune. Overwhelming fortune. But the boys are a little suspicious about where all this money came from. This much money tends to make people suspicious, and that very much disturbs Charles because he still loves his father. Adam, however, doesn't think anything of it. That's right. Charles doesn't want people thinking that his father possibly had stolen this money. Adam doesn't really care. He's just going to take the money and live. That's right. And at this point, Adam is back from the army. The two brothers have essentially made amends and settled down to work the farm, and as they describe themselves, become old farts toiling away in the dirt. (laughs) But Ildi, even after all these years, Adam and Charles are still a bit suspicious about where all that money had come from, and so they're not really spending it. They're living their lives pretty meagerly on this farm. There's nothing really to spend their money on. Charles works very hard at making the ranch successful, and the only things he really buys are things to make small improvements on the farm. And Adam is basically just growing restless. Essentially, they're two incredibly uninspired individuals. Now in our novel, we meet a character who does inspire Adam. And that character is Kathy, who Steinbeck very succinctly describes as a monster and a malformed soul, but one with a very beautiful, petite frame and an angelic face. All Adam sees is the angelic face. Charles, however, sees the malformed soul. Because Adam is good, he sees a perception of good in her. Whereas Charles, who has bad in him, recognizes it immediately in her. When Adam first meets Kathy, her angelic face is not so pretty. No, she has been beaten and essentially left for dead on the side of the road. Beaten by who? By a man of ill repute who had taken her as his mistress. And he had left her on the side of a road near the Trask family farm, where she is then taken in and treated and brought back to good health. But Ildi, only taken in, treated, and nursed back to health by Adam. Charles will have nothing to do with her. And Ildi, at this point, John Steinbeck tells us why he thinks she's a monster. Steinbeck tells us a little bit about Kathy Ames' past. She, from the age of 10 years old, was a bad seed. She used every trick in her book to bend everyone around her to her will. She prided herself on being able to get anyone to do anything. And when she couldn't do that, she got rid of them, literally. Yes, she actually burned the family house down while her parents were sleeping. And made it look like a robbery. Where she would have been killed and dragged away somehow. And to top it all off, Kathy feels no remorse, and she goes off with the money she stole to find her next victim. This is the viper that Adam has brought into the bosom of his family. And he marries her as quick as he can and takes her, although she has absolutely no interest, to Salinas Valley, California. What does Charles think about Adam marrying Kathy and planning to move out to the Salinas Valley with half of their money? Well, Charles is even more convinced that Kathy is evil personified because of a little visit she makes to Charles's room on Kathy and Adam's wedding night. After she has put Adam to sleep by chemical means. So on her wedding night, Kathy drugs Adam and sleeps with Charles. Yes. Yep. With the result being that when she does finally leave for the Salinas Valley with Adam, she's pregnant. That's right. Adam takes Kathy to the Salinas Valley, and he wants to create a beautiful Eden for her. And how does he do that? Well, he needs to dig wells. And who's going to dig his wells? Samuel Hamilton. That's right. We said early on that Samuel Hamilton was a water diviner. He could find water on anyone's land, just not his own. (laughs) Right. But Scott, the serpent in this garden is, Kathy has no interest in having a beautiful Eden in her backyard. She even bluntly tells him, I did not want to come here. I did not want to be here. I will leave you as soon as I am able. And obviously she's not going to be able to leave him until she has her baby. Right. So she tries to get rid of that too. Scott, Adam remains oblivious to the depth of Kathy's feelings. All he sees is that beautiful angel he saw from the very beginning. In fact, when Adam has Samuel Hamilton come out to his new ranch to begin digging wells, he describes Kathy, a kind of light spread out from her, 
and everything changed color, and the world opened out, and the day was good to awaken to, and there are no limits to anything, and the people of the world were good and handsome, and I was not afraid anymore. Kathy brought it, and it lives around her, and now I've told you why I want the wells. I have to repay somehow for value received. I'm going to make a garden so good, so beautiful, that it will be a proper place for her to live and a fitting place for her light to shine on. Nothing Kathy does can warp Adam's vision of her. Well, Ildi, up until now, there was nothing that could shake his feelings. But when Kathy gives birth, everything changes. In fact, she gives birth to not one, but two, two boys. And within a week, she decides to leave. Adam tries to stop her, so she shoots him and walks out the door. Adam does ask, what about your children? And she coldly responds, Throw them down one of your wells for all I care. She does shoot at him. She doesn't kill him, though. As she says, he was in the way and I just needed him out of the way. He was just an annoyance. Well, Scott, before we talk about where Kathy actually goes when she leaves, how does Adam deal with two infant boys in his new state of despair? He does not cope at all. The wounded shoulder is really nothing. It's just the utter despair of having the illusions of his wife finally dispelled. He completely neglects the ranch, cancels the wells and doesn't even name his children, and the raising of the sons for the time being falls to Lee, his Chinese cook and servant, and the only other person living at the ranch at this time. Ildi, what do we know about Lee? Well, Lee is a pretty interesting character, maybe my favorite in the novel. He is Chinese, and most people on first glance would think that he came off the boat, and yet he was born in America. That's right, we should be clear. He is still dressing and speaking like a Chinese coolie. He wears the queue. The long braid. He dresses in the black, for lack of a better word, pajamas. He wears the conical hat and speaks in what we would describe as pidgin English. Right. He's pretty good friends with Samuel Hamilton, and Samuel picks up on this and asks him why he acts this way when he's lived here his whole life. His response is, well, when I speak and talk like an American... Nobody listens. Nobody understands because that's not what they're expecting to hear when I open my mouth. He says he finds it much more advantageous to just continue to go along with their perceptions because that way he's heard and listened to. Ildi, I got to tell you, I also liked Lee a lot in this novel. He's about as close a thing to a hero in the entire story. But let's not forget Samuel Hamilton. He's also a great character. And about this time, he's the one who comes to the rescue of the two Trask boys. He finds out from Lee that Adam still has not named his sons after they've been around for a full year. And Lee suggests maybe someone really needs to physically snap him out of his stupor. And that's exactly what Hamilton does. He knocks him out to wake him up. Yes. (laughs) And Ildi, Samuel Hamilton's primitive approach does work with Adam Trask. Samuel Hamilton actually brought a Bible along to help with the naming. And he suggests Cain and Abel. But that's quickly rejected. Oh, thank gosh. Yeah. So they pick another CNA name, (laughs) Caleb and Aaron. Scott, it's the discussion of the Cain and Abel story that Lee and Samuel and Adam have when they name the boys, Caleb and Aaron, that causes Lee to worry that maybe they've predestined these boys to follow some sort of path because they've been given these biblical names. That's right. Because in the story of Cain and Abel, one brother, Cain, goes on to kill his brother, Abel. And he does that because he believes that his sacrifices to God are being turned away while Abel's sacrifices are being accepted by God. But apparently in the biblical story, God says to Cain, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. Thou shalt rule over sin. And this gets Lee thinking. Will man conquer sin? Must man conquer sin? Can man conquer sin? And he compares translations, and he finds that some translations are quite different. Some say thou shall, some say thou will, and this question of thou shall or thou will leads to 10 years of study by Lee. Well, Ildi, while we have Lee beginning his search for the meaning of some of these words, let's talk again about Kathy. After Kathy shot Adam and left him and the boys, where did she go and what is she doing now? She goes to a rather nearby town, the town of Salinas, and she quickly takes over one of the three local brothels. Ildi, Kathy doesn't just work her way to the top. As she did with her parents, she kills the madam of this brothel and takes over. The madam was just in the way. Yeah, in fact, she will take this brothel to 
incredible new height of ill repute and debauchery. And let's be clear, for the next 10 years or so, Adam and his boys do not know that Kathy is now the legendary madam, Kate. Correct. But there will be a time when all three Trask men will find out. It's actually Adam that learns about Kate first, and it's Samuel Hamilton that tells him. Samuel realizes that he's dying, so the children have decided that they're each going to take their parents in for a month or two. This is sort of his farewell tour to visit all of his kids, including the daughter, who's the mother of our narrator, John Steinbeck. It's here that we find out that Olive, one of the Hamilton children, has a son named John, and their last name is Steinbeck. Aha. That's right. Olive married Ernest Steinbeck. Right. But Ildi, Samuel Hamilton's leaving is only one of his reasons for wanting to tell Adam about Kate. There's a much more important, much deeper reason that he feels he needs to tell Adam now. The other reason Samuel decides to tell Adam is because it's the culmination of Lee's 10 years of study on the Bible passage distinction between the words thou will conquer sin or thou shall conquer sin. And Scott, Lee's 10 years of study has actually given him a third phrase, thou may. Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman. Lee and several of his Chinese friends in San Francisco do an intense study of Hebrew and discover the Hebrew word timshel. They search and search for the best definition of this Hebrew word timshel, and the best they can come up with is that timshel means thou mayest. So in fact, God wasn't saying you will conquer or you shall conquer, but you may conquer. And this changes everything. This means that you have to choose That's right. God puts it back on man. It's man's choice. Man has free will. We're not predestined to be good or bad. It's always going to be our choice. And as Lee says in the book, think of the glory of the choice. That makes a man a man. A cat has no choice, but a man does. Well, why does this final discussion about thou mayest versus thou shall lead Samuel Hamilton to tell Adam about Kate? Because, as Lee says, this matter of having a choice quote, cuts the feet from under weakness and cowardliness and laziness. And this makes Samuel realize telling Adam won't destroy him. Adam still has to choose whether or not he will be destroyed or whether or not he will conquer this problem. And Scott, just as an aside, I have to say that Lee's description of these old Chinese men sitting around with their opium pipes studying Hebrew was one of the funnier scenes in our novel. (laughs) Absolutely. And they were so inspired by this Hebrew, they decide they're not ready to die, they're too excited to die, and are next taking on a study of Greek. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. But let's get back to Samuel Hamilton telling Adam about Kate. Ildi, does it kill Adam? Almost. But Adam decides that before it destroys him to go see Kate. And when he does, it completely shatters the spell that she cast upon him. And Scott, even though this information about Kate frees Adam, he chooses not to tell his boys about her at this time. Up until this point, they both think their mother is dead. But Ildi, it's with the introduction of a new character, the girl Abra, that the boys start wondering about their mother and her death. There's a new family in town, and they have a little girl. And when she comes over, she starts asking questions about their mother. Are you sad? that you don't have one and what happened to her and the boys who've believed all this time that their mother had died start answering Abra's questions but it also leaves a doubt in their mind as to why they've never asked these questions before. Sure she asked them have you visited her grave do you often put flowers there and they realize they don't even know where she died how she died or literally where she's buried. And Abra asked these questions because she overheard her parents talking about their mother, and she got the distinct impression that she was still alive and very close by. I guess we should be clearer here. It's basically an open secret in this town that Kate is alive, is the owner of this brothel. The only people that really don't know it are the boys. And even though now that they're 11 or 12 years old and they're starting to ask questions, they don't get answers to their questions until they're much older. 
Cal is one who doesn't sleep well at night, and he gets up and explores the dark alleys of Salinas in the middle of the night. And in his wanderings, he hears things about that Trask woman who runs the brothel known as Kate's. And so he figures things out, and he sees his mother. And actually, Ildi, at one point he confronts her. He starts to trail her. She notices him and asks him, why are you following me? And he blurts out, because you're my mother, and I was curious about you. This is a pretty monumental meeting. What kind of impact does it have on Cal? It has a twofold impact on Cal. He, first of all, is introspective, and he hopes and fears that his mother's blood is not completely within him and that he is not evil like she is. But he's not sure about that because he has had some streaks of meanness in his past. So he is fearful that it is within him and he can act just like her. And because he sees what kind of woman his mother was, he's filled with pity, compassion, understanding, and affection for his father. Up until now, Cal and Adam have had a pretty rough relationship, but now Cal understands his father a lot better, having met his mother. And instead of acting out of anger that Adam had lied to him about what happened to his mother, he's filled with the opposite reaction. And Scott, interestingly enough, now that Cal has this information, and like Adam is freed by it, he chooses not to tell his brother as well. Cal actually prays for the strength not to tell Aaron because... He's afraid that telling Aaron would be mean. Ildi, in fact, Cal is so afraid that he's going to be, as he says, mean, that he does everything he can to get Aaron out of town as soon as possible, even to the point of encouraging him to graduate high school a year early to leave for college. It's actually kind of ingenious, but this complicates things because he and that little girl, Abra, who's not so little anymore, have a relationship. Scott, tell me what Aaron's studying. He wants to go into the Episcopalian ministry. Which also complicates his relationship with Abra. That's right. It seems that Aaron has a kind of idealized vision of Abra like his father had for Kate. Abra doesn't like it. She realizes that everyone, including herself, have good and bad in them, and that Aaron isn't seeing or accepting that she would have any bad in her. But as Aaron leaves for college, he's not aware of the conflict that Abra's feeling. No, she doesn't let on at this point. Well, Scott, Cal's plan to get Aaron out of town works very well, but it does come back to have some pretty severe repercussions for the family. Yes, essentially it's another retelling of the biblical story of Cain and Abel. One son goes off to college, making great sacrifices to do so, and the father, Adam, loves and accepts the sacrifice of his son. And the other son, Cal raises $15,000 to give as a gift to his father, Adam, and Adam rejects the $15,000 and accepts lovingly the son who goes to college. And this makes Cal snap. The mean streak he feared was there shows. It rises to the surface. And Ildi, what does Cal do? In a terrible scene, Cal goes to his room, takes the $15,000, and burns every single bill. One by one. And after he's done with that... He goes straight to Aaron and says, Come on, I want to show you something. And he takes Aaron to meet their mother. At her brothel. Right. And Scott, Aaron does not take this very well. No, he, first thing in the morning, is waiting at the Army Enlistment Headquarters, lying about his age so that he can enter the Army in the midst of World War I. What does that do to Adam and Cal? Adam is crushed and, as a result, has a series of mini strokes, which leave him partially disabled. Cal is just grief-stricken and guilt-ridden. He believes that, in essence, he's sent his brother off on a death sentence, thus also killing his father. Cal does have one bright spot in his life. Oddly enough, Abra, who had become fed up with Aaron's visions of her, realizes Cal is the more realistic one, and she starts to turn her eye on him and he on her. And it actually becomes a rather sweet story how they slowly begin to fall in love with one another. What about the story of Kate? No sweet ending there. Yeah, Kate starts to see herself as growing old and less attractive and decides to settle things on her own terms. And ironically, leaves all the money raised through ill repute to the... Angelic son. ...who hates all impurity. <laughs> yeah. Really, the only bright spot for the whole Trask family is that Abra is still in the picture with Cal. Abra seems to be the only link to hope that this family has at this point. And they'll need it because a dreadful telegram is about to arrive. Ildi, this is the telegram from the War Department. Aaron has been killed. 
and the ever faithful servant Lee is the one who receives it. And there is a moment that Lee almost chooses not to give the telegram to Adam. But then he says, that's not my right. Nobody has the right to remove any single experience from another. Life and death are promised. We have a right to pain. And he gives the telegram to Adam. And Scott, this pain is just too much for Adam to bear. Yes, and now he has a rather massive stroke, and this leaves him on his deathbed. And Ildi, Cal's reaction? Well, Cal is completely devastated. He loves his father and now thinks that he's basically murdered his brother and is effectually murdering his father. For his choosing to be mean one time. But now he chooses to ask forgiveness. So Cal goes to Adam and confesses that he was the one that told Aaron that their mother was a harlot, which drove Aaron into the army. At this point, Cal looks at his father's eyes and they seem to haunt him. And accuse him. And Cal finds this difficult to face. He turns and walks out. And Scott, as readers, at this point, we don't know what Cal is going to do. You're afraid he's going to go and harm himself. And actually, that's the fear that Lee has for Cal. So Lee immediately tells Cal, go to Abra. She'll give you the answers. Right. And is that what Cal does? It is. And Ildi, does Abra have the answers? Does she help him? Yes, she does. In fact, Abra tells him we have to do something. We have to go back to your father's house. For what? To confront Adam. And Ildi, did Abra know what to do? She certainly has an idea. She says, we have to go back to your father's house. Cal has confessed. Now he needs to ask for forgiveness. And Scott, in this final scene, Cal does come back to the house to his father. And it turns out it's forgiveness he's seeking. Yes, Cal does go back there, not knowing what to expect. And Lee leads Cal into his father's room at his bedside as he's about to die. And Lee says to Adam of Cal... He did a thing in anger, Adam, because he thought you had rejected him. The result of his anger is that his brother, your son, is dead. Adam, give him your blessing. Don't leave him alone with his guilt. Adam, give him his chance. Let him be free. That's all a man has over the beasts. Free him. Bless him. Ildi, what does Adam choose to do? Well, with a monumental effort, Adam slowly raises his right hand an inch and whispers the word, Tim Shell the Hebrew word for thou mayest. Scott, Tim Shell, Cal mayest, mayest what? This revisits what Lee had told Adam and Samuel many chapters ago, that in the Bible, God says, Tim Shell, thou mayest conquer sin, that you have free will to choose. And Adam is telling his son, you too have free will and you can choose to move on and forget your guilt. You can choose to live on with your guilt or have it crush you and die. Yes telling his son that you have free will. You have to choose how you respond. And it's with the death of Adam and the hope for Cal and Abra that our novel East of Eden by John Steinbeck ends. Yes. That's right. Now, Ildi Scott, of course, we couldn't get to every character in this novel or to get to every moment. So if you have a character you want to introduce us to or if you have a quote you want to read, now's your opportunity. Ildi, do you have something? Yes, actually, I do. There's a quote right after Samuel Hamilton dies. We didn't mention it, but Samuel Hamilton goes off on his farewell tour and he does actually pass. And all the people who loved Samuel are contemplating what life is going to be like without him. And Steinbeck writes, there can't be any world without Samuel. How could we think about anything without knowing what he thought about it? What would the spring be like or Christmas or rain? There couldn't be a Christmas. Their minds shrank away from such thinking, and they looked for a victim, someone to hurt because they were hurt. And I think that last sentence just sums up the entire novel. It's very telling because at every turn, the characters in the novel strike out because they're hurt. Cain and Abel, Adam and Charles, Cal and Aaron, everyone, when they are hurt, they strike out at someone else. Kate and anyone. Exactly. Scott, do you have a moment or a character? I'd like to revisit the scene where... Lee informs Samuel and Adam about his discovery of the Hebrew word Timshel, thou mayest. Please do. At the end of this discovery that man has free will, he may choose to conquer sin, Samuel decides that he wants to give Adam the chance to choose and says, if I had a medicine that could cure you of your sadness, would you choose to take it even if it might kill you? And Adam says, yes. I don't want to know, but I want the medicine. Give it to me. And Samuel does. And this is what he says. Adam, Kathy is in Salinas. 
She owns a whorehouse, the most vicious and depraved in this whole end of the country, the evil and ugly, the distorted and slimy, the worst things that humans can think up are for sale there. The crippled and crooked come there for satisfaction, but it is worse than that. Kathy, and she is now called Kate, takes the fresh and young and beautiful and so maims them that they can never be whole again. Now there is your medicine. Let's see what it does to you. Yikes. Yeah, that was some strong medicine. It may sound cruel, but it's really an attempt to inoculate him because it is the truth. And facing that truth, he might be able to move on. And the medicine did cure him. Of Kate. Well, Scott, my quote's not quite as dramatic as yours, but it does illustrate that John Steinbeck used every character in his novel, the major characters and even some of the minor characters that we never even talked about, to illuminate his beliefs about man's choice. Every character in this book had choices to make. And this is just one minor character, Samuel Hamilton's granddaughter, Mary. Actually, John Steinbeck's sister, Mary. Here's the quote. My sister Mary did not want to be a girl. It was a misfortune that she could not get used to. She was an athlete, a marble player, a pitcher of one cat and the trappings of a girl inhibited her. Of course, this was long before the compensations for being a girl were apparent to her. What I find funny is that she's trying to choose to reject the one thing she has no choice about. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) That's right. But as Steinbeck indicates in the last sentence, eventually she does choose to accept her fate. You're right, Frank. Most of Steinbeck's characters want to be something that they're not. But in aiming for that, they usually end up falling on their face. And Steinbeck makes a comment about how riches and poverty... And Steinbeck sums it all up when he says, riches seem to come to the poor in spirit, and the very rich are in actuality extremely poor. Or in other words, we do not choose the circumstances that present themselves to us, but we do choose our reaction to them. Right. So if we look at Samuel Hamilton, who is poorer than dirt, he lived a relatively happy life. But if you look at Kate, who ended her life with over a hundred grand, how happy was she? And Adam and his boys also had money. But they still had to choose whether to be happy or miserable in their lives. It's all about choices. Yes, it's a book about deciding. And as the rock band Rush once said, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. (laughs) Indeed. And I've decided this is where we're going to end today's conversation about the novel East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Ildi, Scott, I want to thank both of you for coming in and having this conversation with me today. My pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Until next week, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. Hi there. I'm Heather Drago. And I'm Sarah Saunders. We host the podcast, That's a Hard No, about saying no and setting boundaries. So you can become that true and empowered you that this world needs. Saying no isn't just okay. It's the key to living an authentic, fulfilling life. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. So while this podcast is in no way a replacement for one-on-one therapy, I suppose I know what I'm talking about. I'd say so. We talk about learning to say no and set healthy boundaries and how it impacts mental health, physical health, relationships, parenthood, and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website, hardnopodcast.com. We're here to help you find your no and say it unapologetically. That's a hard no. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.